wherever you are. Welcome in this session. It's the first session of the last day of the online Enimoro uh, Byzantine Book Festival, as uh, Petro said. I guess this book festival is a very good initiative uh, by Petros Buras Valianatos. We'll all agree to that. So this is the first session of the last day. Please uh, mute your microphone if you haven't done so, um, and we can begin. Uh, well, my name is Daphne Penna, and uh, I'm a legal historian uh, uh, living in the Netherlands, and uh, I'm working as assistant professor at the legal history department of the law faculty of the University of Groningen. Uh, I will be chairing the session, um, and I have, I'm very happy to introduce James Morton and his book. I'm delighted to do that, and I'll say a few words about the author and the book. Uh, well, he will say that uh, Morton will talk about the book, but uh, I will say a few words what I found interested in that book. Um, now, James Morton is a Scotsman living in Hong Kong at the moment, as I understand. He's an assistant professor in the Department of History at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, where he has worked since 2019. Morton received a BA in Classics at the University of Oxford, St. John's College in 2009. He then turned his attention to the medieval era with an MA in Byzantine history at Queen's University in Canada in 2011. And he obtained his PhD in Byzantine and medieval history from the University of California, Berkeley in 2018. He has also held a Rome award at the British School at Rome in 2018 and a Dumbarton Oaks Junior Fellowship in 2016-2017. His research, interest, his research interests lie in the connection between medieval law and religion, focusing in particular on manuscripts of canon law as material evidence for Byzantine legal culture and religious identity. Um, about the book, well, James Morton will present his book, which is called Byzantine Religious Law in Medieval Italy, which will be published in the, in, in the following months. I, I think in March, but James will tell you more about that. Um, the editor, it's Oxford University Press within the series Oxford Studies in Byzantium. And as the author states in his introduction, and I cite from the introduction of Morton, this book offers the first historical study of a group of 36 surviving manuscripts of Byzantine canon law known as nomocanons that were produced and used by the Italo-Greeks between the 10th and the 14th centuries, end of citation. Now the author will say more about this book in a minute. Um, in my opinion, um, the most valuable element in this book is the material itself. <coughs> Sorry, uh, collecting the actual material for the first time studying it and making it accessible as such is a very important achievement altogether. The author provides English translation of the sources and in the footnotes, the texts are given in the original language. This is a treat for general readers and a basic for specific scholars, for particular scholars. And I have to say <clears throat> that despite the complexity of the material, the book is written in a language that one can easily understand and follow and personally, I really enjoyed the style, the writing style of, of, of Morton. Just to give you one example, um, the author begins his section on the Byzantine Nomocanon as follows. I cite now James Morton. If you are someone for whom the Byzantine Nomocanon needs no introduction, then you are one of the select few. End of the station. Uh, um, this is so true. I can even add to that. If you are someone who thinks that you know what the Byzantine Nomocanon is, think again. Um, in many ways, I think this book will be interesting for different groups of scholars, uh, or better said, different scholars will benefit in different ways from the material of this book. There are many subjects that I've treated. And as I said, uh, it's, it's really unknown. It's practically unknown, this material. And furthermore, the particular region of these Nomocanons and the period is of course important and very interesting. Southern Italy and Byzantine influences has always been a fertile subject of studies. And it is interesting to see, and James, James will talk about this, how these Italo-Greeks tried to keep their Byzantine customs and religious practices, despite the fact that the Pope was so close 
and gained gradually authority over them. Personally, I feel really connected to these Italo-Greeks, being a Greek myself and married to a Roman Catholic. But I'll stop with this. I'll give the word, uh, I'll give the stage to, uh, to James Morton. Um, so please, James, the Zoom floor is yours. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Daphne, for that uh, very kind and thoughtful introduction. Uh, so good morning to you all. In case you're wondering, I'm speaking to you from Hong Kong right now, where it's currently evening, which is why it might look like the sun is setting behind me as I talk. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Petros and the other organizers of this festival. It's really great to have this opportunity to present to you my first book, uh, Byzantine Religious Law in Medieval Italy, which, uh, as Daphne said, is due to be released very soon in just under a month's time, in fact, I, is the projected date. Now, as the name suggests, this is a study of the historical development of Greek Christian canon law in Italy, mainly focusing on the southern half of the peninsula between the 10th and the 14th centuries. This was a period in which the region underwent dramatic changes as Byzantine, Lombard, and Muslim regimes were replaced by those of the Normans and their Western European successors. Now, despite the book's name, I must confess that it's not a work of legal history in the strictest sense, uh, although law and legal texts obviously play a significant role in it. Uh, my work on this project began back in 2013 when I was a PhD student under Maria Mavruzi at Berkeley. Uh, I was interested in the great schism, so-called, between the Catholic and Orthodox churches in the Middle Ages, but instead of approaching it from the traditional perspectives of theology or politics, I really wanted to see how evolving institutions helped to shape the distinct religious identities on both sides. So I explained this to Maria one day when we were out for a walk, uh, and she responded to me with the question, have you ever thought about canon law? I had not. So I decided to look into the subject and discovered that actually I was far from alone in this. Now, of course, there are Byzantinists and others who have worked on canon law, but by and large, it tends to be seen as a niche within a niche. It's both legal, thus highly technical, uh, and also religious, thus highly theological. However, as I began to look deeper into both the texts and the manuscripts of Byzantine canon law, I realized that they actually offer a rich, mostly untapped vein of insights, not only into law, but also into the way in which Byzantine Christians interpreted their law and how they used it to build their normative world. That is to say, you can see how people used law to set boundaries to acceptable beliefs and behaviors, and so to shape a shared sense of community and identity. Now, medieval Southern Italy provides one of the best case studies for this. Most obviously, it was a culturally and religiously diverse region in which a large population of Byzantine Rite Christians were conquered and had to adapt to the rule of the Latin Rite Normans, Hohenstaufen, and Angevins. Moreover, these Italo Greek Christians produced a large number of manuscripts of Byzantine canon law, many of which survive in modern collections. In fact, one of the greatest ironies of this topic is that we have far more surviving collections of Byzantine canon law from the post Byzantine era of southern Italy than we do from the Byzantine era itself. These manuscripts, uh, as Daphne said, are known as nomo canons, uh, since they contain a combination of church law, canones. Uh, and Byzantine civil laws, nomi, that affected the church. Unlike modern legal codifications, Byzantine nomo canons exhibit a great degree of variety in their style and content. Although there was a mostly standardized corpus of canon law in Byzantium, there was no officially sanctioned codification of the law. Copyists could choose which laws to include and which not to include on the basis of their perceived usefulness, while they often chose to add appendices of supplementary texts and even marginal annotations that would guide the reader's understanding of the law. As a result, we can study the manuscripts not just as sources for editing legal texts, but also as evidence for the ways in which medieval Byzantines encountered and used those texts. During my research, I discovered 36 nomocanonical manuscripts. I have to say nomocanonical because they're not they're mostly normal canons, but there are some which are not strictly speaking normal canons, but they still have canon law content. So I discovered 36 of these manuscripts that I could identify with a reasonable level of confidence as originating in medieval Italy. Most are still in Italy today, mainly in the Vatican Library, the Marciana in Venice, and the Ambrosiana in Milan, 
although some are also in the UK, France, and even in Russia. At the start of the project, I hoped and expected to find some of the multiculturalism for which medieval Southern Italy is so famous. After all, the Italo-Greeks lived in close proximity to both Latin Christians and Muslims and were subjected to the Roman papacy from the 11th century on. Perhaps there would be some Roman canon law texts incorporated in the manuscripts. Maybe some readers would have left marginalia comparing and contrasting Greek and Latin canon law traditions. To my surprise, I found none of these things. Uh, at first glance, even Italo-Greek nomocanons from the 14th century appear to be completely ignorant of the Latin church and its canon law. Now, one might be tempted to think that the compilers of these manuscripts were just excessively conservative, and some his scholars have said this in the past, but I came to realize two important points that nuance this. First, the lack of non-Byzantine content actually reflected a practical legal reality that prevailed under Norman rule. Norman monarchs such as Roger II were generally hostile to papal intervention in their realm, so they were happy to allow Greek monasteries and bishops to operate within a sort of autonomous bubble of Byzantine canon law. On one hand, the Byzantine legal tradition allowed far more room for secular involvement in ecclesiastical affairs, which suited the Norman kings quite well. And on the other hand, the popes seem to have been surprisingly ignorant about the Italo-Greeks and their customs. My second important discovery was that this state of affairs began to change in the 13th century after the Fourth Crusade of 1204 and the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, which did leave a subtle indirect trace in the manuscripts. From this period on, the popes made a much greater effort to integrate the Italo-Greeks into the Roman church's legal system. Around the same time, we also see a shift in the Southern Italian nomocanons away from practical legal usage to content of a more didactic character. That's to say, the manuscripts of the 13th and the 14th centuries do not simply state what the law is, they also try much harder to explain what it means and also use it to defend the beliefs and practices that distinguished Greek Christians from Latins. For example, it was normal in the Greek church as it remains today for priests to be married and to have children, a custom that the Roman church sought to vigorously stamp out in the 11th to 13th centuries. Italo-Greek nomocanons from the 13th century on often highlight canons that justify clerical marriage, with several manuscripts containing a marginal annotation stating that those canons are against the Latins. Some also contain short interpretive texts explaining why the canons prove that Greek Christian customs around things like Lenten fasting and clerical marriage are superior to those of the Latins. What is especially interesting is that these seem to have been directed more at Greek audience than a Latin one, suggesting that the intent may have been more to dissuade Greeks from adopting Latin customs than to defend Greek customs against Latin criticism. Anyway, I have to sum up now, but I'll just say uh, that I found it fascinating to research and write this book. And although the subject matter can be technical at times, I've done my best to try to make it accessible and interesting to both specialists and non-specialists alike. I hope that you enjoy reading it as much as I enjoyed working on it, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have now.